guy. It's the Kill Your Gods podcast. How you guys doing? Jesse Dram here. We're wrapping up The Crying of Lot 49, Part 4, Chapter 6. And it's a little fucking annoying. I'm going to be a little more careful with my numbering in the future. My guest, she's a comedian. She's just an overall good person. She's a New Yorker. New Yorker. Pinchon. Oh, don't be stupid. Marlenis McMahon. Herc. She is a good friend of mine from the comedy scene. You can go check her out online on all the things at really though. That is R-I-L-L-I-T-H-O. Again, at R-I-L-L-I-T-H-O. She has an internet show coming up soon, which I'll be on, called uh, Most Likely To, the show where we... Fuck. I'm not going to mess it up. It has something to do with yearbook photos. I don't want to... I know there's just a similar show out there. I know Marlenas was first because she's been doing this for forever, but I know I'm just trying to not step on the other person's branding. So whatever, I'm unprofessional. So here you go. Follow me on all the things at Jesse Dram. Uh, I am on Instagram. I am on, I'm actually at Kill Your Gods Podcast on Instagram as well. On Reddit, on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube at Mr. Jessica. Send me an email at jessedram at gmail.com. I'm not getting as many emails ever since, you know, Infinite Jess wrapped up. I'm kind of wondering if you guys still like me. Numbers are okay. Numbers are okay. Most podcasts don't talk about their numbers, but, like, this has always been a weird community project from Jump. You know, a bunch of siphoning off a bunch of people who like wanted to try Infinite Jest but never quite got into it. By the way, we started as an Infinite Jest podcast. Go back and check that in the backlog. While we're at it, yeah, go back and check out the Magical Misery Tour podcast. That was my first podcast. And you'll hear me, a younger me, and a younger Marlenus McMahon Perk uh, having a discussion that was very interesting. I keep thinking I'm going to just like get all those episodes off of Libsyn and make them like the first 60 episodes of this podcast just have them all in the same feed i don't know but we got some interesting topics coming up for you this month i know uh i might be doing an episode on anarchism i'm trying to do an episode on anime i don't know i'm sending messages out to some people what i definitely know is next week guys you want to prep for the upcoming weeks read your bible because me and some friends of mine are going to be going through, uh, it's not going to be like this, we're not going to spend months on this, but we're going to have the first edition, uh, I Hate the Bible, Episode 1, Genesis. That's going to be, best idea ever, worst idea ever, condemning my soul to hell. All are possibilities, you're just going to have to tune in and check it out, I think it's going to be fun. Let me know what books you want me to read in the future. Uh, I have a friend, Seamus, he was on episode one of this, who's really trying to talk me into doing Maka Murray is the author? I'm not sure. I don't know these things, but I want to get out there. I want to read, but what's a book you want Jesse Dram to read? It's, it doesn't even have to be a book you've read. Let's just get into Oh, there will also be Game of Thrones episodes coming up. Uh, the TV show, not the... I almost said the movie. Is there a movie yet? I'm spinning the fuck out. I haven't eaten enough today. So I'm going to get going. Again, episode 4, Crying A Lot 49, chapter 6. Share, like, subscribe, review. I hear it's good for me and the podcast. We'll be back next week with I Hate the Bible to condemn ourselves to hell. And we'll see from there. Right in. Let me know what ideas you guys have for books. I got to I gotta get going. Oh. Before we get into it, the final song from The Crying of Lot 49, a heartbroken young man named Serge has just had his beloved taken from him by the vile coward Metzger. So please enjoy this rendition of Serge's song. Plenty more fish out there, Serge. You got this. What chance has a lonely surfer boy For the love of a surfer chick With all of these humbled, humbled cats All coming on so big and sick For me, my baby was a woman For him, she's just another nymphette Why did they run around? Last night with that day.
up on the football field in back of PS33. Yes, in back of PS33. And it's as groovy as it can be. PS33. And here we are, part fourth and the final of The Crying of Lot 49 by Thomas Pinchon, chapter six. My guest this week, your friend and mine, America's sweetheart, Marlenis McMahon Perk. How you doing, honey? I'm great now that I'm talking to you, Jesse. Uh, no. Thank you so much for having me. No, I really do love you. <laughs> I love you so much. Your fiance should be suspicious. Ah, so. uh, yeah. Be sure to go go back and check out the old episode of Magical Misery Tour with Marlenis on it. That was you and I got into some shit. That was fun. We really, oh gosh, we went from ballroom dance. Uh, oh yeah, we 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 discussed your <laughs> your childhood indoctrination into ballroom dance and referred to it as a a very creative type of child abuse. Uh, I believe Neil called it the uh, fanciest child abuse he had ever heard of. <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, uh, also, um, we talked about police brutality, it was everywhere, but at the same time, I never spoke about the thing that I was there to speak about, so it was like the waiting for Godot of, uh, <laughs> yes, so. Nice, um, so Marlenis, where can we find you online, what do you have to promote? Well, all right, let's start with, uh, By really the way, you, 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 you guys cannot see this, Marlenis is going to be applying makeup for the duration of yep, this pretty uh, much. <laughs> uh yeah uh, so yes you can find me in, uh, <laughs> applying makeup in new york city was good uh <laughs> you can find me on um twitter instagram at really though or now i joined chess.com today uh i made a new friend from india uh i am also really though there it's r-i-l-l-i-t-h-o but more importantly, really though, is uh, Jesse, Jesse Dram, Mr. Dram, if you will. Uh, you're so, finally going to be on my show, right? That's right. I'm going to be yeah. on your shoe. Yeah, most likely to the yearbook photo roast. It is a, it's a very lighthearted roast where you find out why comedians become comedians. Uh, when you see how wretched their uh, yearbook photos were. Uh, and I'm, what is good about Zoom shows right now is that like, I, I, I had the benefit of traveling enough um, when comedy existed to different cities. So it's like, now I get to get like the, the, the comedians from all, right, every coast. That's how coasts work, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> from, from the West Coast, from the East Coast, from- Up coast coming. to the South right. Coast. Exactly, from whatever's in the middle. And so I'm excited to bring on different people to, to have that. And oh, I saw Jesse's yearbook photo and it is delightful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that isn't even the one I thought I was going to go for. I thought oh, I was going to. You can put more than one. You oh, put... even better. Because I was looking for one. There was one photo from my uh, junior year of high school that changed my life because I realized, oh God, I'm really fat. I should do something about this. And then I proceeded to lose a hundred pounds in the next year. Yeah, people don't realize how much, um, you know, adipose and, you know, lipids make you funny. Uh, uh, yeah. I think that's something, you know, fat soluble jokes. That's, that's. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So uh, yeah, so we, we don't have a date set for that yet, but I will make sure you guys know let's all do it about right it. now. March. Where, March. Where are we at? Yeah, nope. I need to be held accountable for something. I am a white woman after all. So uh That's right. You know what you did. I know. Everything bad I did was because of you, white right? woman. Every summer. I know. We were I just trying to protect you and it got out of hand. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry. It's more like I know what I did every November. I guess that's the <laughs> that's the white woman horror movie. Oh, that's like some Jordan Peele thing where he's like, no, it's not a horror movie. This is actually how <laughs> things are. Okay, let's go through it right now since we're here. Okay. Okay. So how about, how about uh, the end of March? Are we good on that? I think I'm good for the end of March. All right. March 26th. How are we on that? March 26th. I can do. Is that a Friday night or a Saturday night? It's Friday night. It is Friday, a Friday night. night, baby. Friday night, East Coast Standard. Uh, what time? Uh, let's say, hmm, let's say eight. 
Let's Friday night, it. eight o'clock. Hey, it's the it, it, TGIF lineup. We're in the full house slot, baby. 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We will have most likely to where I will be roasting my young self where uh, my I, I look like a miniature lesbian golf pro. <laughs> You're giving away the jokes. You're giving away the jokes already. Uh, yeah, man, we're in step-by-step prime time. Uh, Ooh. We make yeah. it better the second time around. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So as opposed to our shared cultural heritage of (laughs) TGIF ABC's Friday night programming block, uh, you might have a different literary background. So Marlenis, what is your connection to literature in general and Pinchon in particular? Oh, shit. Well... I'm By the already, way, if anybody wants to make a all Pinchon podcast, Pinchon in particular, go for it. Great huh? title. Oh, yeah. No, I I actually would probably know the person who made that podcast. <laughs> so uh, uh, I've been reading since I was like three years old. So no, no, uh, no. But for real, for, like I had, I I used to read books. That was a thing that happened. Uh, my relationship to and I found out that his, I, I, I said Thomas Pinchon forever. And then I read something that was like, you know how Beyonce is like, shake your derriere, we your derri on. Like people were like, you say pinch on. And I was like, okay, cool. Apparently, do you know that he's like, um, he's a, like a recluse apparently. Oh yeah, yep, yep. Lives on the Upper West Side. And there have been like, there was like one sighting of him. Uh huh. You probably bumped shoulders with him many, many a time. Who has it? Uh, I, I was going to say, believe me, where you're from in New York, you're not the only p- Pinchon. Pinchon. That's, yeah. yeah, that's his name now. We just, I'm sure it's it's somewhere between <laughs> what you're calling it and what I'm saying. So. Man, Pinchon, you stupid. Like, that just, it flows. <laughs> right? Pinchon, what do, you, what do you know, the future or something? Cause he, we found out right like this year that he, or last year that he's a futurist. Do we jump into that? I don't know. Where do we go? How anyway, is he? Wait. How is he a futurist? Well, so the crime of Lot Forty Nine involves um, a real estate tycoon <laughs> selling, uh, out, selling out the bones of uh, U.S. soldiers. Okay. Losers. Uh, Right, Le- suckers. Leaders, sad. Who was in it for them? Exclamation point. Sad. My daughter's uh, ass. Worst, worst. Uh, millions. Uh, sorry. Speaking <laughs> so, of bones, have you seen my daughter's tits? Which daughter? Oh wait, there's. Sorry. Uh, okay. He only wants to fuck the hot one. Come on. <laughs> what is he? Some kind of pervert? Is there like a one? You think it's he wants to fuck his ugly daughter? He figured it out. Like, I think that Trump couldn't, like, out loud endorse Andrew Yang because Ivan. Wait, is it? Yeah, because Ivan- 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 Ivanka. Ivanka. Ivana is the mother. Okay, yeah. I think I think Trump couldn't out loud endorse Andrew Yang because Ivanka is a robot. There's no non-robot thing about her. Like her bottom half of the mouth is like how a, a robot would be like an, an, an integrated into something. Mm. You know what I mean? So, I mean, you could have a different theory, but uh, <laughs> if you got those Trump checks though, they're really Yang checks. I wouldn't be myself if I didn't put Andrew Yang into something about this. So, um, <laughs> Oh, this isn't because I'm trying to sell you on him. I'm just obsessed. So yeah, uh, that's fine. I'm I'm fine with him. But yeah, so I I knew coming into this, you and I are obviously friends. And yeah. when you found out that I was doing this book, you really wanted on, and you uh, had noted some parallels. Where before we get into the specifics of chapter six, what do you feel are the parallels between the crying of Lot Forty Nine and this particular temporal time wave we are on right now? Yes, thanks for bringing me back into this. Uh, so, right, it's uh, <laughs> there's a real estate tycoon, okay, uh, who like orchestrates a lot of things that you mm. only find out about later, and it's like generation on generation for that. Sounds uh, like a great the, guy, the, right? Great, the, the huge the, hands, 
huge the, yeah the thing that was like and, ah, and this is this, this is unfortunate too because it's like maybe one day we won't talk about him you know what i mean but uh, you think there's gonna be a new godwin's law right mm. you know godwin's law is like every online conversation leads to hitler right Do you think there's gonna be a new one that's like every uh, some kind of conversation online uh, turns to trump i think we've been living in that conversation for <laughs> A, a while longer than i'm right. comfortable with right right to be fair the earth won't exist in the future boy um yeah Eventually. so right so right real estate person doing that but what was the craziest thing and what actually made me think about that um was the entire thing is based around a mail system conspiracy so a postal service conspiracy where the the legacy that the real estate tycoon essentially wanted to um, pass down where all his like cronies were into it all his cronies like um supported it and everything like that uh he his legacy was so petty in terms of shutting down the postal service like not only right imagine whatever i don't know what is our postal service logo it's the it's the eagle and anything yeah. federal it's a fucking eagle Okay, perfect. <laughs> right. Even our eagle didn't like him. The eagle flew like try to fucking pimp slap him. Uh but um yeah, so there's a postal service that uh this real estate tycoon was like just trying to eliminate and not only trying to eliminate, but give really ridiculous uh, petty things for real. Like, right, it was uh what was it, the horn yeah, that exists? And then the the fake one that was like the conspiracy that was like shutting that particular it was trying to shut down socialized post office stuff. Mm. <laughs> and so it was the horn, right? right? And then the conspiracy was they literally put a, a, a they muted the horn. That was mm. the symbol that they used in the conspiracy. So it's like Tristero it was, like, tr was corrupt, bad bad hombres. Did, so, many, so many bad, so many no no envelopes. Uh <laughs> so it's like if 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 he had duct taped the eagle's mouth shut, it's it's almost like that. Like if right, it's like, oh, we don't we don't have eagles anymore. Like it was eagles are that, unreliable and corrupt. Unreliable. Mm, yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay, that was more stewy, but I get. <laughs> I don't pretend to have a good Trump impression. Oh no, for me, I'm saying. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh... <laughs> I like I, I I like the stewy kind of take on it. It's like you can grab him right in the pussy. I can't do a stewy right. either. Mm, yes. Mm, to make the night that bitches mm. get grabbed. Uh, grab so... in the pussy. <laughs> Ah, they, I was uh, actually surprised reading into this. I hadn't realized that uh, Thurn in Texas was an actual postal service in like Bavaria for hundreds you know, of years. I thought that it was. And then I also saw, right, Wells Fargo is also part of this. Yes. Which I, I had no idea Wells Fargo fit in at Wells Fargo. I don't know where you are in the country or the world listening to this, but at least we're just because I know banks tend to be very regional. Wells Fargo is a popular bank chain up in the Wachovia, northeast. Wachovia, if you do throwbacks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Core states, baby. Fly. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there are a lot of, so, okay. Right. My relationship to this. Here's what happened. Right. So. I'm doing a lot of the readings, but I did a lot of the readings before my job ended up becoming reading. So mm -hmm. uh, when I could read things for joy um, in high school, like there was a teacher who just said, these six, choose from these 10 books, read them, come back, regroup. Uh, and the other ones were bitch ass books. I don't know how else to say it, but I was like, let's get some examples. What's some, what's some bitch ass books they're trying oh, to put on you at PS 118. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I saw two things by Jane Austen. And I was like, I don't trust this teacher. I'm just moving <laughs> forward. <laughs> like, it's like, I'm not, I'm not here for that. It's like the crying of love 49. I was like, I'm sad. Uh, 49 is, has a, a, a square root. Let's go. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm sad. I like the visibles of seven. Fucks up, Pinchon. Exactly. Pinchon was good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it was two people in the class 
who chose this book. It was me and my friend Natasha, RIP. Uh, if we're going to do a side note, here's how it goes. Shout uh, out Natasha, wherever you are. Yeah, well, uh, uh, up there, hopefully. And uh, not in a place. Up there where- on the International Space Station. That's right. You know? So, yeah, uh, 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 tragic because uh, she got hit by a bus in the Bronx. And uh, I went to the memorial or whatever, and you know, you know me, like, well, you're the death friend, so you 100% get this. Everyone's funny. sad, and it becomes just like too sad. We're in a circle now with all the other people from our high school. But then uh, you found out she had bequeathed to you her stamp collection. Oh, and then man, the intrigue began. Amazing. Actually, I bet that she would have. <laughs> I bet she would have. But yeah, like people were sad, and all of a sudden I was like, that's why I'll take the bus and people were laughing and there were two people who wanted to be mad. And, uh, this is how I explain that you can make a joke about anything and it's not even edgelord shit. Da, 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 da. So, yeah. okay. Uh, moving forward. So we read this and it just got worse. It just got weirder and worse as we read it the entire time. And now because there's only one person other than me who chose this book in the class, I have one witness. That's how I felt reading this book. I had mm. one witness. It's so heavy handed isn't even the word. I can see why people would um, make a, a, I guess, create the nexus between DFW and mm-hmm. the crying of lot 49, but mm, the names are so over the top. It's just like, it, yeah. it's. I, I, I honestly don't mind that. I think. Especially, I wish this had end notes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think in relation to David Foster Wallace and Infinite Jest, um, really, it's just postmodernism in the fact that like they're just doing. You look like you're putting on fucking kiss makeup. I'm not. I'm a guy. I'm not supposed to see this part of the process where it's just globs. Look. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, namely in, in the fact in that the story just takes a very interesting thing. Like you're not going to see a standard story where they introduce like Metzger, who you think is going to be a major character throughout the book. And then right. he just gets less and less. Matter of fact, the, this chapter oh, opens. It's almost like how Kurt ended up. <laughs> uh, poor Kurt Metzger. This is the second episode Kurt Metzger's come up. Poor Kurt. Yeah, I just... was trying to listen to the things, but I've been working seven, eight hour weeks. So I'm sorry. I love you. Uh, eight, eight hours a week. Where do you find the time? My God. I, I said 70 hours. Oh, I thought you said seven, eight hour weeks. Nope. 70 to 80 hour weeks. <laughs> well, that sounds terrible. Yep. It's it's so bad. I'm sure there's a right. What would my name be instead of Epi, uh, Oedipa, right? Like Oedipa where, Mass? Yeah, exactly. What, what would we be like? Um, Electra Bueno, the Pfizer Mass, or something like that. You know, no. what I mean? e- e- Electra Bueno. That's what I'm going with. <laughs> Yo, Electra Bueno. I can listen. To, I would bang with that. I'm ready. <laughs> All right. So, because we mentioned it right there, let me actually get into the notes because yeah. the, the last chapter of the novel begins with Oedipa returning to Echo Courts, the hotel, uh, where she finds the band, the Paranoids, hanging around the pool. They're all upset because uh, the drum, the drummer, Serge, his girl has ran off with Metzger. So, again, just an idea of how this book is structured. This guy who's been a major character, we thought, just runs off with, like, a side character's girlfriend and gets married. Uh, (laughs) Right. So what's kind of funny reading it today, because I just read it where uh, Serge sings a song about the incident where he makes it about... Notably, it's a... That's a Russian name. Uh, exactly. Yep. Serge. And he sings a song about Humbert Humbert, the main character in Lolita by Nabokov. Yeah, Nabokov. Which is, you know what it is? It's super interesting now because we're like, oh, yeah, you know, Humbert Humbert, Lolita. But this book came out in 1965. So this is still very much in like the pop culture zeitgeist yeah, at this it, point. It's almost like, um, you know, like when uh, VH1 would have like best week ever. And it was like, no, people don't realize that what Pinchon is talking about is like the best week ever of Vladimir Nabokov. Mm-hmm. Was <laughs> it's it, but, right there. Well, now that you even have that with the paranoids where it's like, oh, they're influenced by the Beatles. Like, yeah, okay, whatever. But then you remember the time period, like, oh, he's writing this like 
at the beginning of Beatlemania. Like this is mm -hmm. this band is his impression of like, oh, these Beatles kids are interesting. Maybe I'll slot them into there. They are not yet the cultural monoliths they would become. Right. Right. And like the, these are other parallels, right? We already mentioned the, the Russian thing, right? Mm -hmm. But then also the idea of the paranoids is like, I would, I would, and I, I, apologies if you've already made this connection, but if we're going in the Trump thing, which, right, again, uh, Thomas Pinchon was like a futurist when we didn't realize it, mm -hmm. the paranoids are essentially QAnon. But uh, I they, don't, I don't follow you at all there. Explain. Oh, okay. Well, the paranoids. Like they follow all of these things, right? Mm -hmm. Their name is the par. That's the thing about this book, guys. Uh, the names mean everything and nothing. So that's a thing that was always like Doctor Hilarious. That was always a, a difficult thing for me to follow. I don't. Yeah, know that was an easy. A, a lot of the names in this are like weird, but like Doctor Hilarious for me is the only one that kind of jumps the shark. Other than that, like Mike Fallopian, that's just a weird ass name. I like that, but it's not too weird but. yeah no it's still weird it just right well, like yeah. that like that feels extra like nobody needed that mm -hmm. um but yeah no uh, uh, mm -hmm. it's it's sorry continue i interrupted that's okay we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that because i'm curious about that theory um metzger leaves a letter basically saying that uh he's turning over all properties related to the estate to a different lawyer at the legal firm and Oedipus a little hurt. She's a little bit like, oh, I guess that was nothing. Okay. Um, she calls Professor Emery Bortz at San Narciso College and gets his wife on the phone. She goes by to speak with him about Warfinger and uh, the Courier tragedy, the drama. On the way to the house, she drives by a bookstore and grabs a paperback edition of the Courier tragedy. And she sees that the bookstore has bought, uh, has completely burned to the ground. The man, oh, she meets a man in the government surplus store next door who uh, proudly produces and sells Nazi armbands. Mm hmm. Yep. <laughs> I have right to we proud, like, proud boys. We got them. We, yeah. we still got them. So, yeah, there's, there's that 100%. Is that at all connected to the, the selling of the bones? Of course it is. It's uh, Ping Chong. So I'm, I'm sure it is in some way. I, I'll be honest with you. I finished this book not like I. I don't know what I thought about any of this. Like I, en I enjoyed the journey. I don't know what the fuck happened. So yeah. I'm. Mm -hmm. yep. I'm sure that's part that, of it. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Like I feel like honestly. I'll tell you. It does make me. It does make me excited to go on a longer journey with. If you want to know like what this. taking Ambien is like the first time, it's this. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you say that because just the way it's written has sounded very hallucinatory because it'll be like very grounded and like very easy to picture and then suddenly like just wafting in and out right. of scenes and not almost dreamlike like not really interacting with them things just happening to her right you're like how did how did we get here exactly. uh which must mean thought Oedipa, that's that that's all we were like the paragraphs start with that. Like what? What? <laughs> <laughs> it's literally just a paragraph. McMangus is another. What? What is? It? That makes me think of. Well, we were talking about uh, whatever it is on Friday, right? Like that's a Boy Meets World thing. Mingus. TG. Uh, Minkus. That's right. Yeah. Look how we come back to this. Do you see? <laughs> <laughs> you gotta follow the trails, people. Um, yeah. So. Oedipa arrives at Bortz's house. Uh, she finds him in his backyard getting fucked up with a bunch of his students. He knows a good deal about the Tristero version of Courier's Tragedy, a version he describes as pornographic found only in the Vatican. The version was a... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It was a propaganda piece used by a group of ultra-devout Puritans. Bortz ultimately states, however, that the only person who understood Warfinger best was Driblet, the director of the play, who we find out tragically committed suicide by walking into the ocean a few days ago. So we will never know why he chose to include the original line of Tristero. Are raising my there. hand? Uh, I honestly could not see because I have two pages open here. Okay. Yeah, yes, you know, Mrs. McMahon Perk. Can you can you rewind that back for the listeners? Uh, who drowned? Driblet. 
And why? Suicide. What's our protagonist's name? Adipa Mas. Yes. And there are also Ophelia kind of um, crossovers within the story. Okay. So, yeah. So, like, there are Shakespearean things that are thrown into there. So, the yeah. fact that within this, it's like, did he drown or kill himself? You know what I mean? It, they said he walked into the ocean. It's it very yeah, strongly connotated killing himself. Ophelia. I hadn't put together Ophelia there, but I could, I, I could fuck with that. Right. Also, uh, his name his name is Dribblet. Dribble connotates water. Water. Yes. Uh, I thought he was just a really good point guard who lost his way. But <laughs> <laughs> well, that 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 would be how Dribblet dies. He travels. Right. He euro stepped to his death. <laughs> um, okay. Continue. You're, you're you're. This is so great. I I'm. Right, I have no, it, it, I didn't do this, but I'm proud of you. Sorry. Oh, uh, well, thank you, Mylena. So you, you remember when I was just trying to get people to listen to sad stories from Philly comics, but now. It's been hard. Uh, yep. all, all, all that complaining about the comedy scene and how none of you guys can fucking read. All you read are comic books and you're all dyslexic. And now here I am. <laughs> Uh, no, you're great. What I, what I, uh, there, I really, uh, there's so many things I don't like, like really love about you. And, uh, one is like, you're always open, like you're, you have a very open mind, like, and at least to me, you admit when you don't know something, but I guess I also am the person when, uh, <laughs> a dude is like, can I tell this joke? They run it by me. So who knows? Maybe that makes me a pick me girl. Who knows? But I, hey, I, I still think the, uh, the, the ice cream truck at Auschwitz joke would work. I don't know. Maybe I'm making that up. You didn't I run it by me. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I, I mean I, the ice cream truck. You did not run the ice cream truck. Okay, Bortz shows Oedipus slides of the Vatican copy and explains that the mention of Tristero may have been added in by a Puritan group who wanted to deliver a particular message related to the other that transcends even God. Um, God, yeah, there's a lot of weird shit. He hands her a book uh, by somebody, Dr. Diocletian Blob. Great fucking name, by the way. <laughs> Uh, where they are ambushed by Tristero riders in black capes. Only Blob and his servant survived, and the cloaked men sent him back to England to war the English of the might of Tristero. Okay, Diocletian Blob, if we're talking about that, and we are talking about the time, right? Wouldn't this be right after the Blob was the scariest movie that existed at that time? It would have been, actually. I believe that was released in 1958, so... We're not far off from there. Man, you're a you're a monster. Are you sure you don't uh, have Asperger's? You I know? might be wrong. That one that one just jumped out in my head. I don't know. Uh, I mean, let's see. Let's go on my work computer. I can't wait until they find out the things that I've looked up. The blob year. Uh man. Okay. Oh, there should have been one called the blog. Like that should have been the new one that came out. <laughs> the blog. Okay. Uh, See, nine, I, it doesn't help. 1958, I, you are correct, and it came out yeah. on September 12th. So we still won't get to the the plot of that yeah. episode. Continue. Well, you know, I was also. I think the reason I just remember that is I know there are different versions of that movie. Is this the version of the Blob that was filmed in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania? Why and they are you like this? <laughs> No, 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 because they make a big deal out of it. It's, a, yeah, filmed in and around Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, because the the uh, theater in Phoenixville is where they shot yeah. a major okay. scene. Okay. Colonial okay. theater. In a small rural Pennsylvania town. The Rurger. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> you, think I don't, you think I don't know about Central Eastern PA? What? Oh, I no, I am not questioning your knowledge on that. Like, That's right. I, I don't try. You asked me about the A train. And I'm like, are you kidding me right now? I don't so. travel far. What you want to make of it? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Piece by piece, Oedipa learns how the Tristero was created around 1577 in the Netherlands after William of Orange achieved independence from Spain and the Holy Roman Empire. Empire. I like that. 
uh, mistake I just said, who owned the Texas Postal Monopoly, um, challenged by his cousin Joaquin de Tristero y Calavera, who claimed to be the rightful heir of the family fortune. Tristero believed himself to own everything Hinkard owned, including his job. Tristero fought a guerrilla war against his cousin, a time during which the postal operation fell into a state of instability. Eventually, Tresero gave up fighting and set up his own covert postal system. Oedipa finds out later in the chapter that the Thurn and Taxus system struggled throughout the 17th century, and Oedipa believes that that must have been a period of strength for the Tresero. Bortz for I swear to God, I'm almost done this. Bortz forwards this theory that toward the end of the Thirty Years' War, uh, which ended in 1648, somebody may have tried to merge the two systems but failed. Oedipa finally finds out that the French Revolution saw the end of the Thurn and Taxus postal monopoly, and she wonders if perhaps Tristero won out in the end. Oh, okay. So two things. Uh, one. The 1600s date is definitively important, but I would say for our, uh, for our listeners, how would you define Tristero? I don't know. <laughs> I know. I know Tristero is some kind of underground postal thing, but it was as... literally a question within this as well. Like, yeah, it is. Um, but I also... I, 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 I'm very mystified how Tristero appears in Courier's Tragedy and instantly... Yeah. Yeah. Like, like what? I don't understand why she obsesses over that to begin with. Like, just this three-headed monster that comes out and kills this main character, but the name is what hooks her. Well, that's that's oh, maybe it's self-referential for the author because all of the names are again heavy-handed isn't the word, but like all of the names of the. The paranoids, Oedipa, uh, Mas, even right? right. That that definitively means like Mas. They're and, all you know, more relations or whatever it is. Mm. Like every single name. They're all they're all dripping with intention and reference. Uh, yes and no. Like as I started reading, and I was like, okay, this guy is just throwing things out there at this point. You know what I mean? It's almost like somebody commissioned. You know, well, actually, here I can see. Um, uh, an analogy between him and DFW. So, you know, they would commission uh, David Foster Wallace to write different things, mm -hmm. right? Um, what, I, what I've read of is uh, I, I, I had a dude in your demographic explain to me the best parts of Infinite Jest. A, a white guy explained Infinite Jest to you? That doesn't yeah. sound accurate. <laughs> uh, no, but he... He would he would come to me with like the most like uh, gosh um, palpable exploit um, metaphors of depression that he had in it, and I was like, that's fair. That like mm -hmm. good whatever it was like something burning was one of the main ones. I was like, oh okay, I should probably read more of what he does. Uh, I'm not gonna burn myself, but we out here. So um, with DFW though, right? He was commissioned frequently to write things, and then he was very subversive about it. Uh, right, he, um, consider the lobster, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Maine asked him to show up to write about this lobster fest. Come check out our lobster fest. You'll like it. Butter's right. free this year. Right. He, they, I don't think they had cheddar biscuits. I think that's what the problem <laughs> was. <laughs> that's a, he showed up, saw no cheddar biscuits. Like, you know what? I'm going to drag these people through the that's fucking it. mud. No, right. Unlimited lobster no unlimited cheddar biscuits i can't wait to find out the neurology behind lobster is and ruin lobster for you guys forever <laughs> uh which by the way i i still think those essays are his best work because he was kind of that's what i'm saying e even though he went far out on what his intentional thing was supposed uh, uh, intentional original thing was supposed to be uh i feel like he had how do you mean what you're like, even though he went far out from what his um, initial thing was supposed to be. How initial, that's what I was looking for. What I was trying to get to is I feel when he was totally free to do whatever the fuck he wanted, he just could not rein himself in. But when he was specifically like, go on a cruise, go to this lobster festival, when he had a topic given to him and he couldn't just like jerk off all over it, which I would say metaphorically, but possibly literally as well. Uh, I, I enjoy his writing much more in that regard. Oh, yeah, right. So th that's what I'm saying. Like, he, 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 
subversion is what I mean, right? Like once they commissioned him to do things and he was like, all right, well, you're paying me for this. Cool. It's like what I do in pharma sometimes. I'm like, all right, well, you paid me to write this. So uh, get ready for the realness. Uh, You know who I always use a good example where this is one of those things where I feel like constraints make great art. And particularly when you say subversion, one of the biggest people in all of media in the last hundred years, Howard Stern. Howard Stern, it was huge shock jock, was always complaining like the FCC holds me back. They won't let me do whatever. As blah, 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 blah. soon as he went to Sirius and could do whatever he wanted, he fucking sucked. He didn't have to be creative. He didn't have to work around bullshit anymore. I, I would say that it, it just became an extension of what he was already doing. And also like the people who were going to listen to him weren't going to have serious. You know what I mean? So it's like yeah. he, he, he did a hundred percent like know who his audience was. Mm. So um, yeah, I just think also like sometimes when people get picked up by different um, forms of media, they're, they're, it just automatically changes. So also we don't know if he got told you know, you can say this, you can't say this, but mm. right. And speaking about DFW and what he was commissioned to do, you know what I mean? It's like, he already got uh sign on to do those things. Mm. Um, uh, for you guys who haven't read this, uh, he was commissioned to write about, to write a review about a cruise. Uh, and it was called a supposedly a uh, fun thing I will never do again. And I adore that because, yeah, it, it, he's just like, oh my gosh, you just see the blackness of the sea. Like you see the end of self, you see, mm. <laughs> right? So it's like, he wasn't asked to do that, but they they liked his writing. So then he'd sign mm. on to that, you know? So well, I still think Hunter Thompson was the originator of that. Cause like his- That's fair. Yes, a hundred percent. You are correct. Like yes. he got, he got hired by like a sports, uh, a sports company, something like that. Uh, the original one was to go yeah, write so a, to go write a story about the Kentucky Derby. And he went to the ah. Kentucky Derby and he wrote about like uh, drunken fucking lecherous Kentucky colonels, like <laughs> grabbing waitress asses and vomiting on one another. And I think maybe somewhere at the end, he's like, oh yeah. And uh secretariat one, just like whatever anybody would typically be looking for in that regard. Right? I, I don't even remember how this relates to Pinchon. I'm sorry. I must admit <laughs> no, that. Really, right. Get this mint julep right here. Oh, we're <laughs> talking about it in terms of like um, how uh, it almost seems, sorry, I actually opened this door. It almost seems like based on how all over the place he was with it, it almost mm. seems like he just threw things out there in the way that maybe somebody, almost like somebody he didn't like commissioned him to write this book. You know, I'm like, oh, you want me to write a book? Cool. We're gonna name Dr. Hilarious, Fallopian, the Paranoids, Edipa, Moss, you know what I mean? Like all of these things. Don't, so, don't, don't forget the best name in the entire book is Genghis Cohen. Um, ooh, that sounds anti-Semitic. Oh, I think I think it's pl- it's playing on uh well, I don't I don't know. It it can't possibly be though, because right, the the mm-hmm. uh not not getting down with the Nazis is uh lead exactly he said he said it right there swastika armbands bad right there in black (laughs) and white yeah let me let me dive back into this real quick uh Oedipus spends the next few days going to libraries in between meetings with Bortz and Genghis Cohen she also goes to Driblet's funeral where she realizes she is completely frustrated by her inability to find out why he said those two lines about Tristero in his performance slowly Oedipa begins to give up She goes once more to the bar, the scope, where as usual, she finds Mike Fallopian. Ooh, okay. Here's a weird question. Uh, Tell me what you think of this reference. So she keeps finding Mike Fallopian at a bar called the scope. Is it possible the scope is a reference to a speculum, which is why it's the... What page uh, are we on? Is it before? I am on the Sparknotes summary, chapter six, part two. Oh, you're on the spark, no summary. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was tragedy, fallopian. I didn't mean, um, and excuse me, I'm, I'm just trying to meet you where you are. So that's what it stands for. Oh, are you before we uh, I, explain I, what I, waste I, is? Before what? What we explain waste to be. 
Oh, um, oh yeah, I'm seeing that in the next paragraph here. I got no okay. problem saying right. that. Okay, it's, we're already it. in touch. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Ooh, man, they were really. He was really focused on uh, communism. I'm sorry. Ask your question again for me. <laughs> Uh, she always meets this character, Mike Fallopian, in a bar yeah. called The Scope. I'm wondering if The Scope is an allusion to a speculum, as in like a gynecologist. Because how do you see Fallopian? Through the scope. I don't know. I'm reaching. Uh, well, gynecologists reach as well. So, um <laughs> The I, I, uh, that has to be a double. And also that I would say that's like really astute. So like good on you for that. Uh, I wouldn't have seen it like that. I I would, it, 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 it doesn't mean anything. I don't think, but I don't uh, know. Well, right. I think this is one of those, I, I really think that he wrote uh, an elaborate conspiracy theory just because, you know, like yeah, as a book. Uh, uh, well, it, here's the thing right here. Fallopian asks Oedipa. Oh, so. So if she literally the whole thing so if they keep true right if they keep referring to the whole thing right it's the op the opposite of myopia okay mm. so it's it's literally just including all, uh, it, it almost seems like a way for um mr pinchon to bring people back in to to say this is the bigger picture of things if that makes any sense. I feel like we're starting to say it closer to Cartman now. Pinchon. Like that sounds. Thank you guys and Pinchon. <laughs> um, Fallopian asks her if she has ever considered the possibility that the whole idea of Tristero is just one huge gag invented by Peace, uh, Pierce as a means of fooling her. Uh, while the thought has crossed her mind in the past, Oedipa refuses to acknowledge it as a, a possibility. She gets starts to get angry and leaves the bar. So yeah, that's a whole weird fucking like monkey wrench thrown into the book where, and it would make sense if we've been looking for, you know, sense this entire time and not finding it. What is the note of like, well, maybe your ex-boyfriend was just fucking with you and sending you on a fucking goose chase for all right. of this. Right. Well, that 100% also makes sense because right, if we talked about uh Tristero as a word, right? Trist is right ah. to, to have a secret um, yeah, a relationship little, uh, with someone. And secret it's usually, or junk. Right. It's, it's usually in relation to um, a romantic relationship mm -hmm. or a sexual relationship. You have a tryst with someone. Mm -hmm. But there is also the, the aspect of do we mean in three parts? You know, and tribe. Mm -hmm. Do we mean? Are we speaking to that based on the way that it's spelled? Sometimes, not always, but sometimes. See, yeah, I don't know if that's entirely in the book or just in the summary here, but they're flipping back and forth between the T R I and T R Y spelling of exactly. Tristero. Yeah, no, it's in the book. Uh, hmm. So, okay. oh my okay. gosh, the swastika shop. Man, so, oh, this is what I mean, heavy handed. Okay, sorry, I just looked down to Swastika Shop, which is, it's both in capital letters, which is SS. So, again, it's like, <laughs> God. Yeah, it's like he vacillates between being over the top and then being right on time. So, or, or being like, ah, oh, the readers, I, I, I feel like he's a smart person who probably didn't grow up around like people who got him or people who made fun of him for yeah. uh, being smart or well read or something like that. So he was like, see, right, I'll take this book. <laughs> see, it, it's, it's tricky because I think David Foster Wallace gets praised as a genius so much, but he is like genuine. It, well, genuine, but he's like, you know what it is? He is so. I know a lot of people David Foster Wallace's age, so I have a good idea of what growing up as a smart kid like that would be like. Not saying myself, but I think I have a decent idea. Whereas Pinchon was born in 1937, I think. So I honestly don't know what being like a super smart weirdo in that era growing up, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what it looks like to be the smart nerdy kid in 1950 at the age of 13. I, I feel like I in one of my prior lives, I probably... <laughs> All right, let's see where this is going. What? No, that's the end of it. So. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, continuing. One day, Genghis Cohen calls her. He has a stamp from a U.S. mailbag with the words, We await Silent Tristero's Empire. Oh, my. Silent no longer. <laughs> 
Sorry, that was my bell. Wait, do you, do you edit this now? I don't know what happens. Okay, bye. Okay. Like, I just my That's okay. I'll just talk. Wait, That's wait, fine. Did you edit it? No, no, no. no. I, I, I can edit it. Oh, thank goodness. Okay. But if this doesn't take too long, I might just fuck around a little bit. You know what? Hold on. Let me let me grab the old guitar over here. Let's see. Let's see what we can do. I think okay. Marlene has must have ordered. And we're back. Oh, uh, see, yeah, and we're back. Know, another comic is coming over. I have like three people in my uh, quarantine bubble. So anyway. Uh, Anyone I know or New York folk? New York. You should get. You guys should know each other. Like eventually. Quite continue. Definitely. I mean, once co- once I get my thing, uh, my vaccine, I want to start coming up to New York. I would love for you to yeah. come there. I told you I was dealing with some agoraphobia for like a weird bit there, where like traveling around really fucked me up. But uh, around this time last year, I went to Brooklyn for the first time in ten years, and that was actually a real like okay. And on top of that, my fiance Perry, she has a friend who lives in Weehawken that we've gone to visit a few times. So now that I'm familiarized with the area, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's you're easier. All welcome here. So uh, I think they're super funny, especially, right? Like, you know, sometimes like dark humor in uh, Philadelphia, it's like, doesn't always land, but oh, we love it here. So there you go. Please, please, but, please pull up. All right, hook me up with some shows. All right. Um, okay, yeah, uh, we await Silent Tristero's Empire in the corner, which Oedipa realizes is the elongated version of the W-A-S-T-E acronym that we have seen this whole time. The letter on which the stamp was found came from the burned down books, Zaps used bookstore that she saw in San Narciso. She goes back and frantically looks through all of, pardon me, Pierce's assets as she has come to suspect Pierce owned the used bookstore, which burned down, as well as the government surplus store, which is now selling Nazi armbands next door. So Pierce owns all of this. Um, in fact, Pierce, this word gets crazy. Pierce also owned the tank theater where she saw the courier's tragedy in the first place. Oedipus slowly realizes that every single route that has led her to Tessero can be traced back to the Pierce Inverarity estate. Marlenis, let's just ask here, what is the most you're comfortable talking about? What is the most an ex or a lover or anybody has gone to mind fuck you? Um, by running down every part of my identity and trying to, to tell me where does this come from, even though I was paying for things. You know, I mean, like, um, gosh, the, yeah, essentially that, like, oh, well, why, why is this you? Why is that you? And it's like, I, I don't know what else is... Yeah, what, basically, when somebody else is insecure mm. and they're trying to put that on you. You get what I'm saying? So, mm-hmm. how about you? Uh, I I had an ex. Uh, really was not happy with a breakup. They called up and told me that uh, they had a very bad STD and that I should get tested because I probably had it as well. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know if they were they, fucking... I, they I, a really bad STD. I feel like there are, like, two that are real, real bad. Uh, it, it, it does not seem that this person actually had that STD because I turned out fine, and uh, for somebody for somebody who craves a lot of attention, they don't bring it up much, so I, I don't know. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, pretty much just anyone who tries to make me feel like my identity isn't... You know what I mean? Like, is it what it is because of whatever they're going through? No. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Sorry. Uh, there was a dude who told me, uh, you're Irish and you didn't know how to cook potatoes. I had to teach you how to cook potatoes. So that got to my soul. <laughs> uh, <laughs> See, at first I was like, where is she going with this? But then we were like, and that hurt me. Like, oh, I get that. Okay. <laughs> you get him. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we have, we have common we common heartbreaks not not all of us can have our exes uh you know try to make us believe in long ago underground postal systems you know um right right this is elaborate (laughs) this is elaborate this is a long way to go um she even recalls that uh the diocletian blob book which recounted the tristero story was purchased at zaps 
Emery Bortz, she sees further, is a professor at San Narciso College, a school heavily endowed by Pierce. Oedipus suddenly begins to suspect that perhaps Pierce has bought every single person whom Oedipus has met and asked them to help orchestrate the joke. Yo, go watch Michael Douglas's 1995 movie, The Game, because this sounds like that. Only confusing. Me, but yeah, go ahead, the rest of you. <laughs> uh, all right. No longer sure about anything in her life, Oedipus spends the next few weeks alone, obsessed, and very troubled. She endures all sorts of medical problems. Meanwhile, Genghis comes up with new information each day. He finds an 1865 article discussing the decline of the Tristero from 1800 to 1850 due to internal fighting. The Tristero followers, he finds, most likely came to America in 1850 and immediately moved to the open west where they began stamp production. Oedipa, however, questions the legitimacy of the article. She has odd dreams and toothaches, which get worse every day. Mm. And then uh, we just have the final paragraph here. One day, Genghis tells Oedipa that Pierce's stamps are being auctioned off as, dun dun dun, lot 49 by a local dealer. This is where we finally get the name of it. Oh, that's right. a brand. Uh, Genghis, tell her, Genghis tells her that a man named C. Morris Shrift, so again, Shrift, which is to, Shrift means to fuck somebody over, right? Short Shrift. <sighs> I don't know. It sounds a little bit Yiddish. How is it spelled in that? Sorry. Cause well, I, I, it's this is definitely being spelled to be more of a name with an S C H. Yeah. Well, yeah, exact. Oh, font. Ew, gross. I hate you, pinch owl. Uh, what? <laughs> it means font from German to English. Font. Oh uh, well. Uh, looking at that, if we get away from that, uh, a shrift. We, this is not what I would have thought uh, is a. You know, shrift means point. That's what I'm saying. But I'm seeing another one here that shrift in English means confession, especially to a priest. All right, he's a genius. All right, well now it's for him. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it means font, right? And we're talking about uh, a postal service, which is completely based in type typography, and there are so many components of the book that involve oh, what 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 was this? Um, you know, the marginal error, right? All of the clues that show you that it's not the post service that you would think it is. The fact that that means font from German and it means what in English? Confession? Yeah, sure. That's crazy. That's crazy. Uh, guys, don't don't Me? take mushrooms and read this uh, <laughs> or do. Yeah, maybe do exactly maybe that. Do. Maybe we're both right. Maybe the real Tristero is the friends we made along the way. <laughs> right. Mm. Oh, that's hilarious. Um, oh, so Seymour's Shrift is acting as the agent for a special new book bidder who will not be at the auction. Her interest peaked, Oedipa goes. When she arrives, she is told by Genghis that the mysterious bidder represented by Shrift is actually at the auction. So... Pretty much, Oedipa isn't sure if any of this is real or not. However, somebody wants to buy these stamps, and they're probably a clue to it, because it's where Pierce, like, whatever Pierce made up about the shit, Pierce has these weird stamps regardless, and now somebody wants to buy them, so what do they know? Maybe they know something. She begins to realize that the man who bids on the stamps may be the sole key to explaining the whole mystery. Anxious for the bidding to, get, to begin, Genghis explains that at auctions, the person who handles all the bidding and calls out numbers is called the crier. Oedipus sits down nervously in a chair, anxious to see who the mysterious bidder is as she awaits the crying of Lot 49. You did that, though. I wish I had two spoons so I could play that. <laughs> well, I, I I grabbed the guitar when you went up to uh, grab the door because I didn't know how long you were going to be and I didn't feel like editing, so I thought I'd just bullshit for a little. Go, yeah, man, go ahead. We'll, we'll make a song about this. Uh, well, we'll... I, I have one of the uh, paranoid songs. I have to... Uh, yeah, I have to write music to uh, Serge's song just and I'm going to record that for the theme song this episode. <laughs> uh... 
yeah, yeah can we make a song like off off whatever i don't know i don't know man if uh, you want to try to put something together right now i mean okay, well let's go give me give me a beat you got you got diddy you got 112 you got swiss beach you got pharrell you got timbaland what you got I have I, I have an Ibanez acoustic guitar. That's it. Is that one is that one of the things you suggested? Because that's what I have. Yep, it is a hundred percent. I mean, yes, go on. Okay. So what what aspect of the book is this going to be about, do you think? It, it can't possibly be an aspect. You think there's there's no one aspect of the book. All right. Go why on. why don't you pick a random chunk of the book and we'll like slam poetry? over a beat like you read and i will try to just put together some music oh, behind just, it oh we're just doing that Is yeah that I'm, I'm gonna read just thomas fitchaw is the author of uh author of b period comma the crying of lot 49 the crying of lot 49 That's some fucking acid jazz right there. Yeah. Well, I, have... also, I, I always believe I'm giving, giving the author props for whatever it is. Uh, man, now that I know that there's Mason and Dixon as a book, I am horrified. I don't want to know what I know. I know. I mean, I just heard Mason. I was like, oh, I'm pretty excited. But then you <laughs> threw in Dixon, and what? now you got my interest. Right. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, what, what did you think when you completed this book back in school? Like, what did you think overall? Did you enjoy it then? Me and my friend Natasha were just like, I'm so glad I had a witness to read this with me. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty much it. it. It felt like a different kind of trauma. Like, not trauma, but kind of, like it's, it, you're reading it and you feel like you're reading like, in, I felt every time I read a chapter that there was like a yellow, like light bulb hanging in front of me and like it was an interrogation room. It's like, what do you know about Oedipal Moss? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so it just felt like this is over in a way. And it's like, now we don't talk about this ever again. So mm -hmm. now you right, like seeing it, I was like, okay, cool. Enough time has passed. We can finally unite on this. So <laughs> how did you feel? I don't know how I felt. I have been, <laughs> it, it, you know, what's kind of fucked this over is that I spent so during the time I was reading infinite jest, the only other books I was reading. Now, I'm so glad you're engaged because that would ruin every date. <laughs> you had. Oh yeah. Book. If I had to like, no, 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 no. I, I fucking hate it, but still we should probably talk about it. Why am I was reading infinite jest? <laughs> Go There's on. something in my white DNA making me want to tell you about this. Guys, I'm white. Just yeah, FYI to everyone. I don't know. I don't know if playing the spoons gave it away enough. Boy, go Drake, on. We're white. We're number one for maybe a little bit longer. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, continue. Um, uh, but what I was saying was I was reading. Guys, keep in mind, I'm talking with another comic here, which is why if I seem a little bawdier than usual here, this is all fucking around. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, <laughs> one who reads or used to no yeah. I read every day for work so there you go. Go. Oh, but so the entire time I was I was reading Infinite Jest in quarantine and the only other books I was reading concurrently was I read Crime and Punishment and The Brothers Karamazov like both Dostoevsky I have not I have fucking The Brothers have been in my class okay don't take that as a clip away the brothers have been in my closet for like a year okay <laughs> i can't get there hopefully you can get me into that so yeah notes from underground that's the one mm, i i haven't I, read I haven't that read one that. yet whoa that's 
that noise came out weird. Um, yeah, I haven't read that one yet. I have the idiot on my shelf ready to go. The point is, after I finished Infinite Jest, I started reading simple books on the side. Like, I just read Kurt Vonnegut's Bluebeard. I'm working on George R. Stewart's Earth Abides right now. <laughs> so wow, that's that's weird literary shade you just threw. Like, I'm working on simple books now. <laughs> Like well, no, it, that's with... not shade. The shade is I am a dummy and I need something simple to write a little bit, <laughs> right, to read. So I, so reading something very simple in conjunction with Crying A Lot 49 was just, I, I feel like I did not do myself the service of only paying attention to this book. And uh, I think that's where I fucked up making this four, this four episodes instead of like two because I feel like I should have paid more attention to it. Instead, it was like it was a fun experience, but it was really fucking jumbled. I like at the end where pretty much the entire carpet has just been pulled from Oedipus feet and she don't know what the fuck's what. And just we get this little bit of a glimpse like, oh, maybe we'll get an answer and end of the book by fuck you. Yeah, that's why I think shit. In your research, did you find out, did he get a book deal? Like, it almost feels like he got the advance and then was like, well, fuck you guys. I think this is one of his earlier books, so. No, but still, like, you know, if you get a book deal, you get the advance. And so it's almost like, uh, it it, it feels like, uh, you know how Prince became the symbol? It almost feels like like Thomas did that in book four. Like, mm. fuck you. Like, maybe he didn't like his book deal, but already got an advance and was like, well, I'm just throwing things out. So you think I this was, this wasn't him doing his best? You think this was Thomas Pinchon fucking about? No, it's, 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 well, I don't think that there's necessarily a differentiation. I think fucking around with someone who gives you a bad deal could be your best. I think I, well, I have had mob family, so that's probably. <laughs> well, hey, you, you know, a famous one. Uh, Marvin Gaye, when he was arranging the, um, he was arranging the principles of his divorce. He, one of the things he did is like, I will give you a hundred percent of the proceeds from my next album. And he literally made an album that he phoned in and it was called here, my dear. That's the name of the album. Holy shit. And, uh, that's an incredible fact. mm -hmm. And, And according to him, like I just farted this thing out, but apparently even just farting it out, it's still pretty good. Uh, oh, right. It's, right. Right. So it's like, right. Uh, I guess also if you don't believe in a deal or whatever, like maybe it, it, it felt like too much pressure, whatever it was. Hmm. Or, you know what? I will find a way to write a letter to him. Uh, it isn't have to, you know. Hmm. There you uh, go. I'll figure it out. But. I loved this. Ask, um, ask around. You know people in the city. You get a hold of Pinchon. Yeah, I, I don't want to say out loud that I know a guy who can find him. Boy, you know. So, edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think he'd be right. Well, that, he could have he signed a, an NDA and we don't know about it. You know what I mean? Did they have those in the 50s? Of course what were they? They, uh, they did, but were they standard practice? I mean, I think they just took your patellas. I think that was an NDA. <laughs> now, Pinchon, you'll get these knees back after you've been a good boy. Okay. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, man. I don't uh, know. Oh, uh, uh, I've had so much fun. Thank that's you. That's right. Yeah, I think we yeah, wrapped so it up. It. So, also, we're comics, and so to the to the point of what you were saying in terms of like, oh, he just got this. Like, right? Dave Chappelle just got his shit back in Netflix. Hmm. After, after kind of pulling that out after a bad deal. This is what I'm kind of I, hoping that this alludes to. I almost hope that Thomas wrote this. I, we, we're familiar now, me and Thomas. Uh, I almost hope that he wrote this book in, in defiance of, of a deal that he got that wasn't good. Mm. That'd be interesting. I, we're going to have to look into that. But uh, for I now... Will. This has been a great episode. I guess we're closing closing the book on Crying of Lot 49. I'm not sure what next week's episode is going to be. Uh, me and Neil Wood might might be doing an episode where um, we read and riff on, oh, I don't know, the book of Genesis in a series called I Hate the Bible. <laughs> it might happen next week. It'll happen. 
And that's when you lost several subscribers. <laughs> It'll happen on the sixth or the seventh day. I haven't decided when I want to rest just yet. Ah, uh, well, I know one being who decided. Okay, so, but speaking of which, we decided on the 26th for this show, right? We, That's we right. made it happen live, right? March 26th, most likely to, a roast of your past self. Nope, it's not a roast of your past self. It's just your yearbook photo. That's it. What she said, but uh, I'll be sure, <laughs> if, if you're listening to this in the near future, uh, uh, yeah, just check uh check at really though r-i-l-l-i-t-h-o on twitter you can check my twitter because i will most certainly be promoting it come watch me make fun of my past self my yearbook photo specifically thank you you know i didn't want to conflate it with an existing show because i don't steal jokes or right. okay. Hmm. okay i love you so much jesse thank you love um, you too my you one listening uh and especially thomas <laughs> Okay. There you go. All right. Yeah, this will be. Life. I. Yep. So. I, I'm. I'm gonna put this out in a few days, and I'll make sure to tag you and everything, and uh, promote the shit out of it, and make sure people listen. All right. You already know what time it is. All right. Thank you. All right. See okay. you later, honey. Bye, Peace. Jesse. Later on.